having been somewhere else on Harley Street, having come here, uh, the level of training is absolutely second to none and um, the, the best decision I've ever made, I think. Welcome to the podcast from A Training. It's Thursday, the 11th of August. Um, we are here in Grantham, East Midlands at A Training. I'm joined by Laura Sexton and Joe Caulfield. I'm Chris Wade, I'm CEO of A Training, and we are just going to talk generally about what is happening within the aesthetics industry, legislation, facts, not fiction, and have an open general discussion to look at how we feel um, from our background, how things need to change. So a little bit from me, I've got 37 years within industry and since 2009 we've been teaching and training. We've trained over 18,000 learners over the last 13 years and in 2019 wrote the actual original level 7 which is now on the um, off call regulated qualification with the awarding body qualified. So Laura, do you want to tell us a little bit about your journey because you were the second person to actually receive the level seven? Yeah, I mean, I I came into the industry um, relatively late. Chose a training for my original training before um, the level seven qualification was on the um, off core framework, and. Um, What really stood out for me um, with A Training was the dedication to the sharing of knowledge. And I left here after my original training feeling really confident in um, complications, how to deliver treatment safely. Um, Then the level seven um, came about. um, Arrived on the qualification framework uh, October 19, I believe. And um, you know, for me, I felt it really important to um, have my skills um, assessed against that national framework because, for me, it, it gave me stability within the industry. It um, it almost sort of fulfilled my position as um, the injector I wanted to be, um, and I really embraced being able to be assessed against those standards. Um, in terms of my journey through, um, it, it was hard. I, you know, the assignments were were really important for me, and I really learned a lot from writing those assignments. And it transferred uh, that knowledge transferred to me to be able to become a more confident and experienced um, practical practitioner. So now we are. Uh here with John who is at the beginning of his level seven so what about your journey because you've come from a different background Laura actually was a policewoman and decided that she wanted to go into the aesthetics world and chose a different route totally you came from what was your background an osteopathic background I'm still an osteopath I'm still a state registered healthcare professional Um, I Started training as an osteopath in 2009, following in an injury uh, myself. So I began the anatomical learning and journey because I wanted to understand what was causing the pain. Um, I then studied at university for four years, predominantly nothing but anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology. Um, and over the years, uh, working in clinic where I have um, a, a clinic in Wilmslow, uh, lots of patients of mine particularly the last few years have have been asking me to move into aesthetics because they don't feel they're safe with a lot of people out there who have previously uh, performed treatments on them and they said to me you know John please consider going into it because I will trust you more given your knowledge and professionalism and you know at first I, I I didn't really consider it at all but the more it was discussed um, I know that my hands aren't gonna last forever as an osteopath it's quite physical um, and I actually really enjoy it that's the the most important thing so my journey began uh, many months ago um, actually um, I went on a training course in Harley Street um, for aesthetics, I think it was 
Yes, it was it was it was Harness Street, it was a three day course and you know I came away from that course thinking how is this even allowed where people can literally go from never injecting a face uh, with filler or Botox to basically coming away from there, being able to obtain insurance and, and just be let loose on the general public. And you know, this is coming from somebody who is actually quite anatomically aware, you know, a medical healthcare professional. And even to me, it was just, it was just wrong. And then my, my, my journey then um, began on exploring other options. Who was out there? Who could give me the level of training that I would expect um, you know, for, for me to maintain, um, you know, my reputation. And I came across um, a learning and I actually, I wanted to speak to uh, Chris uh, Wade personally before I made the decision and, and, and ultimately that sealed it for me. I could have gone anywhere and trained, but I have to say, having been somewhere else on Harley Street, having come here, uh, the level of training is absolutely second to none and um, the, the best decision I've ever made, I think. So going back to my original training, when I first um, wanted to actually inject, there actually was only two people in the UK that trained non-medics. So I originally paid a lot of money and it was a fast track course it was a matter of hours and i got several certificates which cost me a lot of money but i was just excited that actually i could inject i could get insurance and it started me on a, a long journey to learning but i have to say it took me many years many treatments and delivering those treatments and lots of training with lots of people following that initial training to actually feel confident to get to the level that I had that experience. And for me, that is what I feel is necessary in any career, any profession, to do a thorough, sound, understanding kind of path. And whether it be an electrician, whether it be a corky gas fitter, whatever profession you were doing, you need to have a qualification so it, it really was a shock to me that actually you could stick a needle in someone's face have a certificate and get insurance so my journey sort of was about championing best practice making sure i, I was on expert reference for the bruce keogh report so for me it's interesting sat here now you know i, I was a hairdresser disappointed my dad when I went into um, doing the YTS hairdressing at 16, but never looked back, very creative. I was ac uh, academic, but not everyone is academic and everyone needs lots of support. But a lot of people that I have trained, whether it be surgeons, doctors, nurses, from all different backgrounds, non-medics, there's one key part really, it's that passion, it's that intention that they want to deliver a treatment safely and they want to deliver that treatment with expert kind of knowledge and a lot of people who have a creative background do need the support and the mentoring so i think for me what's happening presently in the industry um, is really the worst that it can be and change does need to happen and i think in 2019 it took seven years to get the qualification actually onto the um, actual framework for me, the key part is a qualification because the standards really are externally kind of checked. So for me, what is it that you have kind of learned, Laura, since you've actually qualified that you see going on out there that's different? Well, I think for me, it, it really does highlight the amount of poor training that, that is going on out there and I have been to other places um, for extra training, um, independent courses, advanced courses and I think that what we've got to as an industry kind of address is that there's a, a lot of training academies um, who themselves maybe don't hold the qualification um, if they are um, 
teaching level seven. I think that when you're looking for a course, you need to be asking the relevant questions. You need to know how experienced the trainer is. You need to know what it is that you are signing up for. How many modules are you doing? Is there any help with um, development? Is there the ability to ask questions? Do you have um, a contact if there, there are any problems and you can go to um, the academy? I think that with the industry as it is now, change absolutely 100% needs to happen. It is happening with the new um, Bill of Amendment that the Secretary of State within the last couple of weeks has been granted the ability to bring in licensing for um, aesthetic clinics. How do you think that licensing should look? Um, I believe that that licensing should be, um, in, it will mean that practitioners need to be reaching that level of standard to be delivering treatments to keep the public safe and that will ultimately be that those licenses will be granted to people who hold the level 7 in aesthetic practice because those practitioners have been cross-checked against the national framework and have been deemed competent to provide dermal filler, botulinum toxin treatments to clients. How can you as a practitioner not want to deliver the higher standards to your clients? What about John, the courses that are out there then? So you paid not a cheap but a premium price to go to a Harley Street training but there's courses out there for £500, £200, discount 70%, buy a course, get one course free. I think now presently this industry, the aesthetics industry is awash with bargain bucket type courses what do you see the difference from your present osteopathic training to the aesthetic world why why do you think that level that's presently in what you hold needs to come across into the aesthetics world legislation you know safety in practice mm -hmm. is is something that the general osteopathic council push for as with any al uh, allied healthcare professional, there's a governing body who strictly monitor um, the professionals in practice, um, and that is something that the aesthetics industry doesn't have. You know, there's there's no governing body, um, so anybody can go out there and do it, and I just can't believe that that is the case. And what about the premises? What about you know doing it in someone's home? What about because you couldn't go off and do your treatment in someone's home? No, but you know, you know again, if, 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 if you need a sterile environment, I just don't see how being able to practice from home would give you um, a sterile environment. Um, you know, so I, I don't think you should be able to practice from home unless it has been absolutely converted into what would be considered a sterile and completely safe environment, ticking all the boxes. So there's lots of talk about dermal fillers becoming actually a prescription on your medicine upon. I've really thought this right from the beginning. Um, there is one thing that's kept this aesthetic world at the price level that it is, and that's the fact that botulinum toxin is a prescription on a medicine. If we look at um, actual microblading or the actual micropigmentation, when I first kind of came into this, it was 750, 800 pounds for um, a set of brows. Now you can get a set of brows. When microblading came in, the industry just dropped um, lower and lower and the discount became more and more and more and the quality became weaker and weaker and the training scores became more and more. And I think the reason why the aesthetics world is hanging on by literally the needle is due to the fact that there is one thing that is keeping this is face-to-face -face consultations and also prescription only medicine and I think once we take dermal fillers across to a prescription only medicine this will make the people that actually are doing it correctly it will take the price up 
and it will take the training to the level where people that are looking for training will only be able to access training in registered licensed training centres with products that are protected by the fact that they're available only through a audit of a prescription only with face-to-face um, -face consultations so alleviating any issues any medical histories and a support I've never felt that this industry has been about medics versus non-medics mm -hmm. I think that's totally gone I think actually now it's non-medics versus non-medics I think it's dog eat dog price war I think the quality the standards gone totally down and I think for me very clearly um, it needs to change and it is a ticking bomb it is a ticking bomb that if nothing is done something will happen and I think the non-medics have been given the ability now to get fully qualified but yet they're still waiting until the day that the government makes them do it it's always the same thing really and I think it's sad that having put all my own money into the qualification getting it on the frame I could have kept it for myself and I decided not to because the importance for me was to actually get that kite mark to be off call regulated so that we were externally audited because that gives the actual qualification merit and it's important. But even though we put it out there, there are still people that are cutting corners, that are price warring. And again, thankfully, with the consultation that's coming up, I believe the right amount of change will happen. But before then, I think we as professionals are needing to create our own lane. I think very quickly before the legislation comes together, there's going to be a very solid divide between those individuals who actually take the high road, take the high standards and champion in it. So if you were to give a overview of someone who's looking to come in the industry, Laura, what is it that you have learned from your journey? Because you've spent maybe, what, £100,000 yeah, over I the last... It, yeah, it's got to be close to 100000 over my my journey of development, I suppose, into being the best practitioner that I ever wanted to be. And for me, I think that... I, I am from the viewpoint that there are no corners to be cut. I put myself at the forefront of leading the, um, the way the aesthetics industry should be and really do champion the best practice. And ultimately, it comes down to the measurement of practitioners and the competence of their injecting but also their consultation process, their decision to deliver appropriate treatments, um, their aftercare, their follow-ups, their informed consent. And I personally wouldn't have done it in any other way. Um, yes, I've spent the money, but equally, I can be rest assured that I'm delivering treatments safely and um, with, ethic, with ethics um, taken into consideration. Um, I believe that the way forward for the industry in clean, really cleaning things up, um, if we're to put it simply, is that everybody who is serious about providing these treatments does um, take the level 7 in aesthetic practice um, because that will future-proof um, your career. This is the way that the industry is going and is well needed. It, it, it's been an absolute brilliant um, part of developing the aesthetics industry. But what that does mean is that even though there are other, other training schools offering the level seven, you've still got to do your research into the standard that is being delivered. You know, it's okay. There are people discounting level seven courses. There are people offering level seven at a cut price. That is which I have to say is against off call. It is regulations really. You should not offer a discount on a qualification 
there should be no enticement into taking a qualification. It should actually be done on merit and merit alone. And it has to follow a set standard and way of delivering a qualification and that is not possible at a discounted price. I can tell you that presently per learner we make the least amount of profit mm -hmm. per actual learner intake but for me there is no other way to do it Absolutely. I won't discount it I won't take it down and I think that goes right away to you are working in an affluent area John you you come from a different part of the country and you charge a premium price presently and you'll continue to charge that premium price when you move into aesthetics so what what do you feel about your competition and the people that's out there that's charging less what what do you think of the price war and everything that's happening well again you know i charge a premium osteopathically because um you know i i i've reached you know that that point as an osteopath you know i pay the premium or people pay the premium to see me because i'm very good at what i do the price really shouldn't come into it too much i, I as as far as you know you seeing the right person who's qualified and safe in practice is concerned the people who are offering the discount prices well i mean that is that is something um, that needs to be tackled as well because you know you can see it I was only looking at a, you know, a, a, a an eight point facelift online for seventy nine pound ninety nine last night, you know, and you know, and it's an online course to to be injecting derma fillers, and again another reason why I think fillers um, should be prescription only, to to eliminate this misuse of because there are probably more complications come from uh, injecting derma fillers. Uh, than, than anything else and, and that is you know one of the biggest reasons why it should absolutely be prescription -like. and I think it's also the pharmacy because again if I look back in 2009 there was only two three main pharmacies that actually provide product for the aesthetics industry now hundreds and popping up every moment every day there's someone else that's selling products someone else bringing products in. I was privileged to be part of a um, BBC kind of programme where we went undercover and obviously as we know the products that are available you can get online. Um, they're not actually registered, they're not actually the correct product, you don't know what's in the product. I personally do not know how anyone can inject into another person something and not know where, how, what that product is however unfortunately money greed profit comes into it and I think that's again where it needs to get kind of mopped up stopped um, and I think insurance is the other part because I think when I again came into this there was only one two insurance brokers because basically that's what it is the shop front is the broker behind the broker is the actual underwriter and I can see with claims and the increase in claims that these brokers who have come into the industry that personally don't understand really prerequisites, what people need, what's the underpinning knowledge. They are giving training schools the ability to teach and um, giving them premiums to allow them to actually offer this. But unfortunately, behind all of this is an increase in claims and increasing issues and the underwriters are very uh, much at tipping point that I believe what will also change is that within the next two years I think there will only actually be 20 people that will be able to gain 20% of people that will only be able to gain insurance because people are price led and they go oh I can get my insurance for XYZ but when you look at the small print and when you look at what you're actually insured for half the time you're not actually insured and time and time again I hear people who have had claims that haven't have been underwritten um, issues with um, people with insurance so again I think across the board every aspect of it needs to be actually mocked up so if you 
were to give someone advice about insurance, um, have you actually um, started researching your insurance, John? Have you looked into insurance? I have, and I am insured. Um, and I think because I'm classed as a medic, I was entitled to um, you know, a higher level of protection. I think what surprised me, um, you know, slightly going off piece there, I think what surprised me is I, as I've been learning, I've been obviously learning different things and techniques and I've been adding things to the insurance or I, I sent an email off to the insurance company saying, can you please add these? And I got an email back saying, you know, John, as a medic, you're actually already insured for these things. And there was no proof required of, you know, of what I'd learned. And I, I couldn't believe that. This medic, non-medic status has got to stop. When you are a nurse, when you are a doctor, a GP, they know no more about injecting products into the face than Mary the cleaner, Lisa the hairdresser. They know no more. It is about the quality of training that goes into it and that's what matters, nothing else. Your status as a doctor, an osteopath, a nurse, a dentist shouldn't even come into it and that has got to be stopped. And only the General Medical Council can really stop that because I feel that these people are using their titles as a way of misleading the public. I really do, that's, and I feel quite strongly about that. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Laura? Have you changed your insurance? Have you swapped insurance? Did you do research on insurance? Yeah, actually, I went from one to another um, probably about three years ago and actually then realised that was a bad decision. So um, I went, and this was, you know, when I was very uneducated about um you know, put, put insurance companies into the same uh, category in that, um, oh, I will, oh, I'm going to go with that, that other person because they're a bit cheaper. Well, actually, um, what then transpired is I didn't, you know, I was insured for things that actually I was surprised I didn't need to send certificates off for. And actually, when I questioned it, they said, oh, it's fine because um, you'll need your certificate when you make a claim. When actually, what they're doing is they're insuring for everything, not not doing the checks, but actually, what that means is if they haven't seen proof of certification, how can they insure? So that's going to be where the problem lies if claims are made. Um, so what I would say with in terms of insurance is you need to do your research and find out what it is you are insured for. We're all bad at reading the small print, but actually, this is really imperative. And what you were saying, Chris, about, um, you know, in the next couple of years, whenever it may be, um, that only 20% of um, people will actually be insured for the treatment that they are delivering. Um, I think that's really key. And insurance within the industry is, oh, yes, I am insured and I can do these treatments. Actually, the checks do need to be made. And insurance companies themselves need to be um, really looking at the services that they are delivering and for what they are um, insuring for. Because you'll only ever need an insurance company when you need to make a claim. I agree. And that's when it's predominantly too late. Yeah, and it's absolutely. the support and it's everything that goes mm -hmm. with it. It's your livelihood, yeah. your business. The other thing as well is, that, you know, in COVID, I was surprised there was lots of online learning, which was great. People were making great use of the time. But what surprised me was how many people actually got CPD, potentially, course um, certificates without actually delivering the treatment and actually having the treatment. I think the key thing for me, which surprised me, was that a lot of people don't understand what CPD stands for. So continued professional development means you're already qualified and you understand the modality in which you are um, offering that procedure, but you are upskilling in that particular modality to increase your knowledge or your education, but you understand fully how to perform that actual treatment. There isn't a CPD course that can do that at basic level. So the basic, the foundation, and that's why really for me, the level seven is key that everyone needs to do that 
because then obviously they can move forward and specialize, go off and do expert, maybe do a particular area that they feel um, that they excel in, you know, certain things, cannula, PDO threads, or kind of whatever area it is. But fundamentally, the key, the core, the true part that they have to get right is fully the theory, the practical and the practice and for me someone should be spending a minimum of a year on their foundation on their qualification which is what the level seven is it's a minimum of a year and achieving a minimum criteria of at least um, 80 to 100 models across all parts of the discipline of that area and that's what we do here and that's as a minimum and that's why you cannot discount it that's why you cannot play this um, let's fast track it let's see you know do your case studies um, here there anyway you have to do it correctly so research is really really important and I for one will not take the standards down I for one will not change I for one will not really make a discount and a call to do it fast track it has to be done correctly um, what excites you about your next stage then John once you've kind of qualified in your level seven because you kind of into your journey so what's the best bits of what you've done so far oh i think just just seeing how you can make a difference to somebody's appearance and it's an appearance you know or the difference that the patient is seeking um as well to be able to facial match somebody and to be able to see the areas that you know, that you can safely improve um, I think it's going to give me a huge amount of satisfaction and I think I need, at this stage in my career and my life, I actually need to be enjoying what I'm doing and I think that's the most important thing, I do enjoy it, I will enjoy it and I think it will see me out into retirement. What do you think about all the claims and all of this, like, you know, be your own boss, get your own Range Rover, um, X, X, Y, Z, thousands per week, you know, how, what do you feel about how on social media it's pushed to do your fast track access into aesthetics and earn xyz laura um, I, two two things i think that is um unrealistic um, when you're first starting off but if we're promoting that success is based on the range rover or the the holiday that you go on when actually that potentially could lead people to making quick decisions um, doing treatments that are not appropriate or they go down the route of let's get as many clients in for cheap amounts um, which lo massively lowers the standards um, to provide safe appropriate treatments in a clinical environment takes time has some expense um, for a practitioner but actually, where we sit in terms of being a level seven aesthetic practitioner is that we don't discount, we don't do Black Friday sales, we don't, you know, we lead the way in improving all standards within the industry. And, you know, to cheapen what is a qualification by promoting that you can do it in a really quick time and you can go from nothing to this in three months. Um, three days three days exactly that aesthetics is something that cannot be rushed this is something that you cannot fast track it is just it's unsafe it isn't right and this is where the legislation but is needed and actually as a practitioner to choose that route and think that you are going to go away confident is actually unbelievable it's not going to happen so therefore what you lead yourself open to is um, anxiety stress a worry and a feeling of incompetence to deliver the treatments and you either do it um, unsafely or without confidence to make money or you end up having to repeat and redo and we've seen it through uh, learners 
I, I would say at least 30 to 40 percent of our learners are redoing yeah. courses that were not to standard they were not qualified so they wasted yeah. their money and you've not saved money no. you've actually it's cost you sad more. sad really yeah. sad and it's it again it's about research of what you are actually um taking on you cannot do this in a short quick amount of time because you will not be able to deliver those treatments another thing that i want to finish on before we close up this um podcast is our responsibility to the young generation and the new people that's coming through as the public as well because obviously with instagram and the promotion of aesthetics and how it's pushed towards the you know the perfect face the perfect shape the good thing coming out of covid i think is everyone watched their faces um, melt and came out and thought you know what maybe i did a little bit too much filler a little bit too much xyz and had a reevaluation. and for us personally it's all about skin it's all about the foundation but i think if i look at my niece for example who's 13 and i remember a very strong conversation where she said to me uncle chris when can i have my lips filled and i think as a responsibility in the industry with body dysmorphia and the cooling off period how we actually perform treatments i mean it shocked me that it's only recently that the actual law changed that now it you know it thankfully it's illegal to inject someone under the age of 18 and when i went to actual parliament and when i was involved in that with the government i was shocked to know that actually that hadn't already been done so i think although sometimes it takes a long time i think the shifts need to happen to protect people also from people who have done a one two day course who are actually putting a product into someone's face they do not know what's going in and probably a good majority are not either insured at all or maybe they have an insurance that doesn't cover them for the treatment or the certificate that they've done online you know so i think on all parts it definitely needs to change so what what's your kind of cornerstone and how you're going to do a consultation in your clinic taking it from i mean as an osteopath do you treat your client in the first five minutes of meeting them no there's an initial consultation um and i will only treat that um, that patient if they are suitable for treatment once I have diagnosed what the problem is um, you know you can only treat if there's a diagnosis so I take quite a thorough comprehensive case history regarding medication previous history of any pain discomfort any family issues cardiovascular problems all of these things have to be ruled out systemically um, and only once I know it is safe to treat that patient I will treat if there is something um, that isn't right or I feel that I need to refer them whether that be to A&E or back to their GP for the appropriate treatment that's what I'll do. So when you did your course in Harley Street we, was this covered? Did you talk about consultation, cooling off period, what oh, no. to look for, what not to look no, for, no, no. how to work alongside healthcare practitioners who can support you? No, none of that was discussed within 15 minutes of being there, we were given a mannequin's head to inject with a needle, and within five minutes, the first clients were coming through the door, and we were injecting them. And, and I think one of the biggest things, when I came here, and I'm really glad I've done the course in Harley Street, yes, it cost me over 6,000 pound, but what it did, um, what, what it taught me was just the difference between a, a, a bad course and a, and a good course. And when I came to uh, A-Learning, I, I think it was a whole new level. And before you even go in with a patient or a client, um, everything is explained to you. You sit down in a classroom, you understand what you're doing before you even set eyes on the client and the patient. And, um, you know, and, and that's the biggest thing I, I took from that. Well, I think that the thing is as well is, you know, when it comes to price, we have 27, you know, full trained, paid educators, staff, support, mentors, 
coordinators, qualified people who are here constantly on hand. And I think really that's the most important part is to know that you've got that constant support at any point when you need it as well. Because, you know, we're not all academic learners and we all have different learning styles. So I think, you know, we all as creative people need someone to kind of support us. I know, you know, you have a daughter, Laura, um, mm. who is a teenager. What, what, what responsibility do you think as a model, as a mother, as a, as a practitioner to her coming up through the pressure, social media? Oh, I think social media, you know, as much as it can be a great um, tool, um, I do think that um, us in the aesthetics industry have a massive responsibility to ensure that the treatments that we provide are promoted ethically, responsibly. And I think that um, the consultation process, which it, it needs to be um, enforced for all clients, um, new, um, review, I think that for the younger generation coming through, there's massive pressure to um, conform, to fit a stereotype, to be that person that is seen in the media, um, when actually we, as responsible practitioners, um, are able to a certain extent control what we deliver to the wider world um, and it's about making responsible decisions not injecting people who haven't had a full consultation not doing walk-in appointments not promoting services to under 18s or younger people um, and it's about being you know really responsible for the message that we are delivering to the general public and particularly younger people. Great. Well, thank you for your time. And it's good to hear um, both your journeys. And I think what's for me is exciting for the next couple of years, I truly believe that this industry will be the strongest it's ever been. I think the people that survive will be the ones who deserve to deliver the treatments and I think the price will go up and I think the standards will go up and I think the future will be really positive but I think it needs to be those people out there you know our inbox our kind of um, engagement with people is always when there's a TV you know oh you know why well, they're gonna take this injectables away from us is it gonna happen a non medics gonna be stopped well, for me, instead of asking when, why, what, get yourself educated at the correct level, future-proof your career, do it correctly, and then set your standards the highest it can be and stop doing offers that really you should not be needing to do if you are good at what you do. Your clients should be referring you to their client their friends their family from the fact that you are good at what you do your work should talk for you and that's what we've built our reputation on you know 93 percent of our learners come back and do all our advanced courses so although we don't make a massive amount of profit on our level seven qualification we know that once people realize that we are the best they come back they stay with us and they do all the courses and that's why we're busy, we're not doing discounts. In fact, we're looking at increasing the price because really we believe that the quality and the quantity that we give is the best that's out there. It's like apples and pears. You cannot actually compare the quality that you receive. Um, so I think just be wise, pay cheap, pay twice um, and you know, don't read the forums as being the gospel um, and 100% you'll hear it from here first, factual and actual, um, and um, keep it to the highest standard that it can be. And I'm sure that you're going to have a very successful business. There's some amazing people that I know that we've trained that are doing better than ever in this economical downturn because they've kept to their standard, they've kept to their price, and they are the best of the best within the industry, and they know that they're going to survive this 
and change that will be definitely change for the better.